In this example, we have a solid drum or a barrel which has been elevated through a distance h of 5.5 meters. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to allow that barrel to roll down the slope and what we want to determine is both its angular velocity and its linear velocity once it reaches the bottom of the slope. So once again, we have a conservation of energy problem and we know that the potential energy given to the barrel or the drum is going to be converted to kinetic energy. But we need to take a little bit of care here because when the drum reaches the bottom of the slope down here, it's going to have both linear kinetic energy because it's going to be traveling in a linear direction like so, but it's also going to have angular kinetic energy because it's going to be rotating at a certain angular velocity. So it'll be moving in both a linear direction as well as rotating. So what we need to account for in our energy balance is both linear kinetic energy plus angular kinetic energy. And we're assuming that there's no losses, therefore all of the potential energy is being converted to the two forms of kinetic energy. So next, we can substitute the expressions for potential energy, kinetic energy, and angular kinetic energy into our formula. Potential energy is mass times gravity times height. Linear kinetic energy is a half mv squared. And angular kinetic energy is a half i omega squared. Now, as we look through this formula, we can see that we know the mass. Gravity is a constant and the height's given, so we can calculate the potential energy. If we move on to the right hand side of the equation, again we have a half which is a constant, we know the mass, but we don't yet know the velocity. If we continue to the final term, we have plus a half i. Well, i is something we can calculate using known formulas for solid cylinders, and we'll do that in a moment. But what we notice is that we have another unknown. We don't know the final angular velocity. So in actual fact, we have two unknowns. We don't know the velocity, and we don't know the angular velocity. So if we have two unknowns, then we can't solve using just one equation. We need a second equation. Now the second equation that we're going to use is the equation that's used to convert between linear and angular velocity. V equals R omega. So we have a choice here. We can either replace V in our first formula with R omega, or we could rearrange for omega, which would give us omega equals V over R. And once we'd rearranged for omega, we could replace omega in the original formula here with V over R. Now in this example, I'm going to replace V with R omega here. So let's rewrite our original formula. We get mgh remains unchanged. We get a half m. Now instead of v, I'm going to put r omega. And that's squared. And then we've got plus a half i omega squared. So now we've got rid of V, we only have one unknown in this equation, and that unknown is omega squared. I'm going to rewrite this slightly. MGH equals a half M. Now in order to remove that bracket, I need to square the R and I need to square the omega. So R squared omega squared plus a half I omega squared. Now there's a number of different ways that we could manipulate this formula, but recall that the thing that we're trying to find is omega. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a couple of brackets and I'm going to do something that we've seen previously called collecting like terms. Now let's just put a bracket around here. We have a half m r squared in a bracket. Now we know m and we know r, so that bracket there is just going to be a number. And if we do the same to the second term, I've got a half i omega squared. We're going to calculate i in a moment. So a half i is just a number. Let's say for argument's sake that a half mr squared was 3. 
And let's also say that a half i was 2. Well, what we have then is we have 3 lots of omega squared plus 2 lots of omega squared, meaning we would have 5 lots of omega squared. We can collect the terms because we have 3 lots of omega squared and we have another 2 lots of omega squared. So in total, we have 5 lots of omega squared. So I'm going to do a similar thing here. So I have m, g, h, and I have a certain amount of omega squareds. Well, that amount is a half m r squared plus a half i. All I've done is collect those terms together. Now, it's useful to leave all of that in brackets because what I'm going to do next is I'm going to divide each side and I'm going to divide each side by a half m r squared plus a half i. So again, it looks like it's going to be complicated to rearrange, but a half m r squared plus a half i is just going to be a number. So I get omega squared equals m g h over a half m r squared plus a half I. And it's all of that on the bottom of the fraction, like so. The final step then to get omega on its own would be to square root each side. So I can lose the omega squared and square root our right hand side, like so. Now you could substitute your values in at any stage during this process. I've carried out an algebraic method, but there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't calculate MGH here and you could calculate a half m r squared here, and you could calculate a half i here, and substitute each of those with values. It depends whether you prefer to work with algebra or whether you prefer to work with the numbers. So there's a number of different approaches here. Now before we do our final calculation, we need to calculate our value for i. And i, for a solid cylinder, is a half m r squared. All of these formulas for moment of inertia are provided on the equations and information sheet. So we have a half times the mass of 45 times the radius squared. Just take care here, we've got the diameter. So the radius is half the diameter, or 0.6 squared, giving us a moment of inertia equal to 8.1 kilogram meter squared. OK, so now we can substitute everything in, in order to calculate omega, because omega equals the square root of mgh, well m is 45, g is 9.81, h is 5.5, .5, and it's all of that divided by a half, so 0.5, m, 45, r squared is 0.6 squared, plus a half of our inertia, so 0.5 times 8.1. Now just take care here because it's all of the top divided by all of the bottom, and then the whole lot square rooted like so. So you might want to try running that through your calculator just to make sure you get the same answer. And running that through the calculator gives a value of omega equal to 14.14 radians per second. OK, so we have one final step in order to calculate the linear velocity of the drum. And all we need to do is go back to our original second equation, v equals r omega, and plug in our values for r and omega. So we have v equals the radius of the drum, 0.6, times omega, 14.14, giving us a linear velocity of the drum equal to 8.48 meters per second. So now we have both the angular velocity of 14.14 rads per second and the linear velocity of 8.48 meters per second.
In the next video, we'll look at another example very similar to this, where potential energy is being converted to both linear and angular kinetic energy.